you think to where the league is now, and it's it's definitely the a pro- progression that needed to take place, sure. right? For the health of the athletes and for the care of the athletes, it's continued to progress and progress and progress. That's the important thing to remember, I think, is you got to take your chances. Money shouldn't be what drives it. You got to take your chances. And then when you get the chance, you got to maximize it and then just keep learning, you know, day in, day out. You just keep learning. Yep. And, and then you just develop a reputation. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined in line later today by Steve Tashjian of the U.S. Men's National Soccer Team. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you the quickest recap of the week that was, a little deep thought, and then we'll jump into our show. So, what's going on? What is new? Coaching continues, but is definitely winding down. Had our last session with Tyrell Terry. The other day, sent him back to Minneapolis. He's got about a week, and then he will be in the NBA draft as of next Wednesday night. So excited for him, excited to go up there. Joey and I are going to fly up Wednesday, hang out, just celebrate him. So very excited for that. Then it's quick turnaround. I mean, two days later, free agency starts. So fully expecting a handful of my guys to have new destinations, new homes, and just excited for them to go through this time and continue, uh, you know, just living their NBA dreams, man. Very excited for these guys and hopefully everything works out for them. So also crazy to think that as busy as I have been up to this point, I may be very, very dead here within just a few short weeks. So it's been interesting. I had a little taste of that this week, but I'll talk more about that here in a minute. So coaching winding down, kiddos are in their winter sports mode, at least for now. You never know. Uh, The city of Fishers is recommending that they shut down kids' sports. If that happens, I don't know. I'll keep you updated. But as of now, Cade is in basketball. Seems to be doing really well with it. Love that he's focused. Love that he's listening. He's being just very coachable, which is a new thing for him. So I'm excited to watch him play basketball. Kendall's in indoor soccer. So that's been really fun. Also, just not coaching. Just being a dad, being able to support them and watch them. I don't know if I can do it forever, but, you know, maybe just taking taking some some time to do that, interspersed with some times where I coach them and going back and forth. We'll see. But it is nice. There's, there's pros and cons to each. But for right now, it's fun to just sit back and watch them play. The weather's been amazing here. Been loving that. Got outside a ton. Today was the first day in like 10 days where it hasn't been probably 70 degrees, 60, 70 degrees out. So cooling off a little bit, but still very nice, beautiful fall weather here in Indiana. So as promised, a quick recap of the week that was. And the reason I'm doing that is if you go back, I don't know, 30, 50 episodes, somewhere in there, uh, I was giving you a little deep thought or something to marinate on for the week. And so this week, I want to get back to that. And I want to get you thinking about getting more out of your life, also known as how to be less distracted. So this really started when I was on vacation back in July. I was reading the new, at least at the time, it was the new Ryan Holiday book called The Art of Stillness. And as the name implies, big focus on, hey, you know, you don't have to do things all the time. You don't have to be distracted or tethered to your phone. You know, there's times when just creating space for yourself is beneficial. So I read that and that really kind of resonated with me. And then in short succession after that, I read a book called The Bullet Journal by Ryder Carroll, another fantastic book. Uh, I even tried the whole method for a little while, didn't love it for some of the day-to-day operations because I've got a pretty good system there. But what I loved about that book was just being more intentional, like taking notes, I mean, that's something, at least for me, back in the day, I could just remember anything. And I don't think it's so much an age thing as it is I've gotten away from some of the good habits that I cultivated over the years. And for me, when I'm watching a video or when I'm listening to a lecture, if I'm active in the learning process and I'm writing things down and I'm taking notes, that really helps cement things in my brain. So just being reminded of that was worth the price of admission for reading that book. And then the last piece of this was watching the new Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Now, keep in mind, I realize that every 
documentary on the planet has a bias. This one I'm sure is no different, but just understanding the fact that some of the smartest people in the world are actively trying to hack your brain and distract you all day long and keep you on their social media sites is somewhat worrisome to me. So it was like this perfect storm. I read Art of Stillness. I read the Bullet Journal. I watched Social Dilemma. And I just really started to realize like, man, distractions are just rampant, right? Distractions are rampant. And and we talk about it a lot for kids. And by all means, it, it's a massive issue with our kids. It's something we struggle with, with our children and something we're trying to create boundaries for. But I think in a lot of ways, it's even harder for some of us in like the 30 to 50 range because we didn't always have this level of connectivity growing up. Like when I was growing up, the internet wasn't a thing till I was in high school and email was like a bigger thing once we were in high school and then college. But like, it just wasn't what it is now. And so what I've started doing was just thinking back, like, man, when was I the most productive? Now, granted, I didn't have kids at this point in time, but I think back to when I was doing like in-home training, I was working ridiculous hours. But if I had an hour to go to a coffee shop and crank out an article, I would do it. You know, I wasn't getting distracted with email or Facebook or Instagram or whatever game I was playing on my iPhone at the time. I was into writing that article or I was into creating that product, getting that outline done. And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is I just flat out had fewer distractions. And, you know, when you think back, if you're over, say, 35, you probably realize when like email was the worst thing on the planet, right? Oh, I I get so many emails. And now you kind of laugh about that because email is like the least of our worries, right? It's all the other things. It's all the buzzing. It's the notifications. It's the social media. Like those are the things that I think are really holding us back. So something that I've done in the last couple of days, and I will keep you posted on my progress here, but I basically deleted social off my phone. Uh, I didn't really get on Facebook anyway, except to talk to people or interact with people in my groups like iFastU or the Complete Coach Cert. If you weren't in a group, I wasn't probably scrolling my feet. But Twitter, gone. Instagram, which stung a little bit, I'll be honest. Not so much because I love Instagram, but it was one of my primary ways to interact with my athletes. So basically, I'm going to try and find some sort of balance there where, you know, maybe on my my iPad at night, I'll give myself five to 10 minutes because I think there's value in that in staying connected, especially for my athletes, because they're all over the place. I like to follow their lives, see what's going on with them, but also just not having that connectivity where it's in my pocket and I can access it all day, every day. And, And ultimately, the goal here is to carve out that time to think, to flesh out my ideas, to write more. So yeah, that's where my head is at. Uh, hopefully you enjoy these little debriefs like this. And if stuff like this resonates with you, please let me know. And most importantly, take action on it. There's a bazillion distractions out there these days that I feel like are holding us back from being our best selves. And for me, it's about being the best husband, the best father, the best possible coach that I can be. And I think if I eliminate some of these distractions, I'm going to get there. So Without any further ado, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to jump into this awesome new episode with Steve Tajjan. One thing Bill Hartman and I have talked about for years now is the power of mentorship. Early on, I didn't have a mentor to shape or guide me, or most importantly, help me find the blind spots in my own training and coaching. But luckily, after many years of trial and error, I found Bill, and my professional success exploded as a result. But the downside to the mentorship process, at least professionally, is that it can be pricey. For private mentees that I work with, it costs anywhere from $3.99 to $5.99 per month to work together. And while I know the results go far beyond that price, the fact of the matter is that just won't work for a lot of folks. So when Bill and I sat down a while back, we asked ourselves a really tough question. How can we help shape the future of the industry and truly make it great? And beyond that, how can we create amazing content yet make it affordable to virtually every trainer or coach out there? And the answer for us was simple. Restart iFast University. Here's what you'll get when you become a member of iFast University. One update each month from myself and Bill. This could cover anything from improving exercise technique to writing better programs and everything in between. Twice per month Q&As, 
where Bill and I will personally answer your questions to help you become better at training, coaching, or even running your fitness business. A Facebook group where you'll be surrounded by like-minded trainers and coaches who are serious about getting better, and access to the iFastU archives, where you'll be able to watch literally hundreds of pieces of content from the iFast team over the years. This blend of content and Q&A is specifically designed to help make you the best trainer or coach possible. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to ifastuniversity.com to get signed on. We'd love to have you on board. Steve Tashton is currently the head performance specialist for the U.S. men's national soccer team. Prior to this, Steve had two stints with the Columbus crew in the MLS, which bookended a five-year run as head of sports science and conditioning with Everton of the English Premier League. In this show, Steve and I talk about his journey as a physical therapist and strength and conditioning coach. We talk about the role of opportunities in our career and building our character with each new role. We talk about why it's so crucial to find your identity and role within an organization or in a position. And last but not least, we cover Steve's recipe for being a great leader. This episode is chock full of great information, and I know you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Steve, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to catch up with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name's Steve Tashton. I'm the head of performance for the U.S. men's national team. And I started back in 2002 when I graduated with my master's degree in physical therapy. And just along the way, you end up meeting the right people, getting into the right circumstances. And those individuals help mentor you. They help guide you. They give you your opportunities. And then you just kind of build on those opportunities until, uh, you know, you you decide that you've you've had enough and it's time to go fishing. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it started with some time in MLS and then had a chance to go abroad. You know, during that time, you, know, you get exposed to different challenges and becoming strength and conditioning coaches and learning more about being a performance coach and then having your opportunity to lead performance departments and learn more about how data science and research can can make you a better coach, better leader, better director. And that just kind of continued to snowball into, you know, opportunities abroad, opportunities back here. And then, you know, after, after some time in Europe from 2009 to 14 with, uh, with Everton, we came back to the States and I was lucky enough to hook up with Greg Berhalter at Columbus Crew Soccer Club. And uh, we were there for a good four and a half years together. And then when he went to the national team, I joined him. So um, very cool. Again, over a period of about you know 15, 18 years, I got to work on a couple of different continents, and and then now I, I get the opportunity to to work within a national team setup, which is tremendously different than anything I've done before in the past. So yeah, I love it. I love it. And we're definitely going to touch on that, but let's go back <clears throat> even before the work started. Like, what got you <clears throat> interested in the world of physical preparation and physical therapy to begin with? Yeah, I don't think it's too uncommon of a story. I was a uh, <laughs> soccer hack that got hurt and needed rehab. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so that started it. You know, I had a little bit of a, a taste of just what bad rehab looked like, what good rehab looked like. Right. And then just started to appreciate movement a little bit more. I was very medically inclined when I started as an undergrad. And so I don't think I was ever too far away from some sort of an interest in, in a, a medical bio, biomechanical type of field. And, and then as it you know, as I slowly started to mature and realize what I kind of had more passion for, um, you know, that, that's what kind of got me going down the physical therapy route. And, you know, I think in general, I'm finding more and more as I work with top practitioners that whatever their degree was that got them into the industry is is usually just a starting point. It's, yeah. a, very, it's a smaller building block to eventually this huge, gigantic set of skill sets that you know, top practitioners have when yeah. they get to, when they get to upper levels. And that, I don't think that's too different of a story for me as a therapist. I think it's constantly a, a tool that I rely on as, you know, you're trying to make decisions and trying to get things right. But over, over time, you just start to do, you know, stack skills on top of skills. And then, yep. um, you know, you, 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 you usually end up somewhere where you never knew you'd be. Right. Yes, and absolutely. I don't think, I don't think my story is too different there, but that's kind of what got me into it. It's just this, I was, uh, I was into all kinds of different sports. I probably had enough injuries to where I spent a lot of time around people that, that were trying to help me in a, in a rehabilitative way. And, and yep. that got me interested in, in moving in that physical therapy route. I love it. 
I love it. So last but not least, talk to us in a few more specifics as far as your career path, because I think a lot of people that listen to the show and especially the young coaches, they're like, oh, wow, you know, he works for the men's national team. Like, that's my dream job. But they don't, they just see where you're at now and they don't see the progression. So would you walk us through that just so they kind of understand your career arc? Sure. Yeah. You know, we touched on a little earlier. Sometimes you need a little bit of luck. And my my first job out of grad school, I was working for Jim Liston, who's now the high performance director in Toronto. And at the time he was the head fitness coach for the LA Galaxy. And he had a facility in Pasadena. I grew up not too far from Pasadena. And when I graduated, I just happened to interview at his place and I started working there right away. And he, he and I kind of connected early on and he saw my interest in strength and conditioning and, and in professional sports. So I, I started to assist him a little bit. My mornings looked a little bit more like, you know, one of his assistants in, in looking after players. And then in the afternoons into the evenings, I would treat patients and, and see athletes and oh, wow. work within the private setting. So I really yeah. did start my career in a pretty cool environment and yeah. I was probably two or three clicks ahead of most people who try to get into professional sport just based on how I started. Yep. There was a period there where I had uh, moved down to San Diego to start a practice with some friends of mine. And right towards the end of 2006, Jim had already started helping Ziggy Schmidt in Columbus because Ziggy had moved on from the LA Galaxy and he was now in Columbus. And then it got to a point where they're like, you know, we need to bring somebody in full time here. And they they started looking for a strength and conditioning coach. I actually called Jim to ask him his advice about possibly going to Chicago with a fire. Okay. And he said, he goes, well, why would you go there when you can go, when you can go to Columbus? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he talked he talked me into to going to Columbus instead. And then in 2007, that was my first role as a head strength and conditioning coach. I had done some consulting work in collegiate soccer that gave me a chance to kind of lead some things as a young coach. And the main one was I got to lead Azusa Pacific University, the men's and women's program as a consultant for them as a performance consultant. Ooh, that's 2005 now, yeah. somewhere around that range. And then by 2007, January, 2007, I was in Columbus. So that was the early days. And then right. I, you know, you just get your feet wet and you can't, I mean, and, and the funny thing is, is I don't think anybody nowadays that age I don't think they understand like what we went through in MLS at that time. You know, I was making less than 30 grand a year and I was a head, you know, the head fitness coach, head strength and conditioning coach for a professional club. And people, I think sometimes that gets missed at that time. I don't, there wasn't many full-time strength and conditioning coaches in the league. You know, I was in Columbus. I think Dave Tenney was still in Kansas city. Yeah. And I think it was like Paul Winsper was in Toronto at the time. And that was it. There was only three or four of four of us. I don't think wow. Pierre was in New York yet. Right around now, Pierre was in New York. Pierre Barreau was in New York. And that was it, man. And it wasn't a very, the, the position wasn't staffed at a lot of clubs, you know, so yeah. you make your way through it. And, and sometimes, especially when I talk to young coaches now who are in the league, either as assistants and they're looking for the opportunity to be a head guy or whatever it might be like, they just, they really aren't aware of how difficult it was in the beginning. Right. We won MLS Cup in 2008, and I was making 34 grand a year. Wow! <laughs> we won MLS Cup, <laughs> <laughs> and then you think you think to where the league is now, and it, it's it's definitely the a pro- progression that needed to take place, sure. right? For the health of the athletes and for the care of the athletes, it's continued to progress and progress and progress. That's the important thing to remember, I think, is you got to take your chances. Money shouldn't be what drives it. You got to take your chances. And then when you get the chance, you got to maximize it and then just keep learning, you know, day in, day out. You just keep learning. Yeah. And, and then you just develop a reputation. And yeah. that's what I try to tell people is the, that's the only thing you can control really is, you know, your reputation yeah. and the rest of it really depends on that kind of the rest to kind of take care of itself if you focus on it. And yeah. that's kind of how things snowballed into more and more opportunities. and. You will have you will have key moments where you'll look back on it and you'll know that it was just right place at the right time. You know, me right. going to Everton was exactly that. They had Everton had come to the United States in 2007, and David Moyes was the manager, and they just happened to be in LA. And Mark and I think even Darcy were a part of you know talking them into, hey, let's come out and do some work with you for a week. And at the time, it was Athletes Performance, now yeah. Exos. And within seven days, David Moyes says, I want an American strength and conditioning coach, you know, at Everton. (laughs) So that whole thing had taken place. They had staffed it for about a year and a half. 
some things didn't work out. Shad was already in Germany. And so Shad Forsyth was yeah. kind of filling a role between Germany and Everton until they found a full-time replacement. And we just happened to go to Everton on preseason when I was in Columbus. Wow. And I'd known Shad for a little while. And Shad said, hey, you know, this is this position is open. What do you think? And, you know, I said, you know, why would I not be interested in that type thing? And right. on paper, the people that I, you know, the people I was competing against for the job on paper, I sh- never should have got the job. But, <laughs> you know, David Moyes was adamant that he wanted an American fitness coach. So, you know, it kind of moved me to the top of the list. Me being a physical therapist as well, I kind of, I think, sealed the deal. Right. Because it separated me from the rest of the people that they were looking at. And again, it's just right place, right time. And I think if David Moyes doesn't sign a contract with Athletes Performance in 2007, then I'm never there in 2009. You know, that's right. kind of the way it works out. And then again, now that I'm there, my reputation is the only thing I can control. So if I do... If I do a good job and I, I meet expectations, then, you know, now you, it doesn't matter what your CV says, you become a part of the, the culture there. And, and then that just kind of translated to a five-year stint there. And it wow. was great. Yeah, it was great. What prompted you to come back then? <laughs> you know? Like... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you just, your, your priorities change. You know, I, I, my wife and I got married in 2005 and then four years later, you know, we're in Europe. Right. And it was just the two of us, you know, we, so we said, why not? Let's go. Right. Right. And then within, you know, within the first year, our, our daughter was born in Liverpool. So now you have a family. Right. And, you know, the family starts, you know, to people start getting older and your priorities start to change a little bit. And I think in that last year, Roberto Martinez came in and it was a great year. You know, it was really great to work under a new manager and, and, and get the, develop the skill set of being able to move your attention from one way of working with one manager to another way of working with another manager. Yep. But you know, he brought in, he brought in Richard Evans who, and they have had a relationship for so long that, you know, I started to see that my upward progression at the club, you know, had a ceiling now. Yes. And so I, I, I was very upfront with Roberto and, and, and said, you know, if I've been here five years now and, and I'm just kind of thinking about how long I keep my family in Europe, and if I have opportunities to keep growing, then, you know, we'll, we'll stay. And at that time I had told him I was, I was going to be trying to, I was looking into the opportunity at Arsenal and that at that time, that would be it. If I got it, I was going to stay. If I didn't, we were going to go home, you know, right. and then and Germany won the world cup and German coaches started taking all the jobs. So Shad got the- <laughs> yeah. no, no, he deserved it. He, listen, he deserved it. But, you know, Shad, Shad got the Arsenal job and then, you know, Darcy had the AS Roma job not too long after that. And then yep. the positions in Europe were just kind of filling. And I thought it's the right time to go home. You know, right. you know it's been it was a great decision, man. And then Greg is I, that's the this is the best working relationship I've ever had with a head coach in my entire career, and including the time I was with Ziggy, who was yeah. fantastic in my in my maturation as a coach. Yep he was a big part of me being able to, you know, develop the skills, the emotional intelligence skills to be, to be a high performance director. I love it. But it was great, man. And then that's kind of translated to where we are now, you know? Yep. No, I love it. So I realize that this is somewhat of an obvious question, but I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. You went from MOS with the crew to Everton in Europe, obviously, and then you come back to the crew. Yeah. So you've kind of gone back and forth between the two, and I'd love to know your thoughts what were the biggest differences between the two leagues from a physical preparation perspective, right? Not just right. from a soccer perspective, but like as far as the culture of strength and conditioning, what was different? Oh, man, I tell you, you really, I can't speak to all of Europe. I can only speak to the environment I was in. Sure. You all of a sudden, like I had to develop my skills as a salesman. You know, mm. like this is, I've said this on a couple of different podcasts. I realized it was like starting a small business because at that point, you're selling a product. Yes. You know, you you you're you're in a position where nothing's mandatory, right? But <laughs> for you to do your job, the manager above you expects you to convince everybody to do it, even though he won't make it mandatory. His expectations is that listen, I'm hiring you to get the job done. Just go in there and you know and make sure that you produce an environment where guys are getting stronger and they buy in to something new that's going to make them better. And I was right. like, all right. You know, it, it inherently you you start realizing that from one culture to the next, that sales pitch looks totally different. But all you're trying to do is trying to engage the individual because they're now your 
primary audience. They're your they're your main customer, yes. really. And and it's it was a very very different way of operating. Uh, when I was in Columbus the first time around, it was more about selling Ziggy. And once Ziggy was sold, it was this is what we're doing as a club, and okay. you're either on board as a player or you're not. Whereas in uh, at Everton, it was much different. So that particular process was interesting because there were there were guys on that team who physically were incredible specimens and had never stepped foot in a gym once in their entire career. Right. Moved great, robust as can be. They've been injury free for seven, eight years of their career. Doesn't mean it's not going to catch up to them or didn't catch up to them, but right. you also have to evaluate. You your sales pitch can't be, hey, I'm going to make you better. A lot of these guys are like, have you watched me play? What are you talking? You know, yeah. like it's egotistical and we all see that, but at the same time, they've got a point. Yeah. Marcy always tells a story about working with Ribery at Bayern Munich. And he walked in, he said, oh, I'm one of the best wingers in the world. Why are you telling me you're going to make me better? And he was like, holy crap. He's right. I got to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to change my pitch here, you know? And that is, that was something totally different that I really didn't have to deal with in either of my stints in Columbus, to be fair. But there it became something totally different. I relied a lot on the people that had already been at the club so I could understand the culture of the club and what was important. What did the players value about that environment that made them want to stay there forever? You know, it's, those are important things. And trust is the starting point. As soon as they started to feel like, okay, you know, there's a, there's a authenticity of this guy. And if I go to him and I say, I don't like what he's doing, he's either going to adjust, change it, or first and foremost, he's going to go, what do you not like about it? Let's talk about this. And all of a sudden I have a say in what I'm doing, right. which most of the time they, they were either force fed it or it ended up, you know, ending in a confrontation or whatever it might be. And that was the adjustment on my part. Cause I, I was, I was then, I still have a little bit of it now. I can, I can start to get a little bit hot headed and the process of being aware of what's surging inside of you and blocking your frontal lobe at that moment <laughs> is, it was, was really important. I was, you know, 30 something years old and just needed more work and understanding how to communicate to people. And there were some, some great, great practitioners that were there. Danny Donick, he's still there. He was the head of medical when I was there. And he was super, super calm, even keel guy that really gave me, uh, you know, a lot of a great example of how to just kind of enter situations with a little bit more composure. And, and that was one part of the process there that, that it was a completely different environment that required a different skill set. And I came back to Columbus and it was back to this, you know, situation of just selling the manager, sell the head coach and, and, you know, it'll, the rest of it will take care of itself. So it was, again, it was back to a different model that right. had a, you know, different need, but no, uh, it was, it was an interesting five years. You, the, that period probably did more for me as a, as a human coach than it did as a strength and conditioning coach hmm. for I, sure. Yeah. I like that. Yep. So yeah. You mentioned Darcy in the last section, and you guys mm -hmm. are unique in the sense that you haven't just worked for clubs, but you've worked for your, your country now as well, right? right. And obviously, Darcy right. worked with the German national team. Mm -hmm. So what are the differences that you see there? Like, what are the differences between working for a club where you've got the guy maybe 10, 10 and a half, 11 months out of the year and mm -hmm. working for a country where, hey, man, you're, there's a lot of work being put in behind the, the scenes but you may only have somebody for weeks or months throughout the year. Yeah. Your mission changes totally Okay, because I think that's the, the starting point. And I think Darcy and I share a lot of similarities in that when we enter into an environment, first thing we always ask ourselves is based on the constraints that were presented, what's going to be our identity as a group, as a performance department, right? Because that identity is, you know, is obvious. within it, you're identifying your role in the player's life. And then once you have that established, now you start to understand, all right, what are the key values we have to have as a group to fulfill that mission, right? And we started at that, at that point. One thing we realized is we don't drive performance development in players in this position. We support and promote performance development in our players in this environment. You drive it when you're at the club. You drive it when you're a, right. when you're within the club setting. So, all right, we've at least started to establish pieces of what our mission is going to be. Now, once you've done that, you keep working further. All right, in order to be supportive, in order to promote, in order to be a resource, what are some of the key values you have to have? Well, with us, 
you, we have to put the player first. We have to have a very player centric mentality and philosophy, because if we want to be successful, then we need to have our most impactful players available. Yes. That, that's the bottom line. And if, if that's our number one objective, then we can't have a national team agenda. We have to help the clubs and promote and support whatever they're doing so that we can continue to keep our player available and playing well in their environment. If they're available and playing well in their environment, they're going to be available and playing well in our environment. And now all of a sudden, the you know, we're not writing strength and conditioning programs. We're not creating anything. We're, we're trying to think of ways to either fill gaps or share information. Can we be doing something on our side that they're not getting at the club? And then can we make it so transparently available that it almost becomes a part of their data management system? It almost becomes a part of the metrics that they look at on a daily basis to evaluate what's the profile look like of this player, you know, because it needs to be a 360 degree view. We need to understand what's happening with the player when they're not with us, but the clubs need to understand what's happening with the player when they're not with them. And that's our role. Again, can we support and promote high performance in a way that makes it, you know, useful for the clubs? Yeah. Can we, can we be looked at in a way where men, the, the high performance department with the U S men's national team makes us a better high performance department at, Toronto, Chelsea, you know, Juventus, whatever it is, right? right? We 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 need to fulfill a supporting role. So you, now you start to drill down what all those values should look like. And some of the things that popped up for us was player centric, transparent, collaborative, you know, integrated, and and innovation and innovative. Those types of things started to pop up as words that we thought would be most important for us. And I think that starts to snowball as you start to see different situations where each club is going to need you in a different way. Each sure. player is going to need you in a different way. And that's kind of been the hallmark of our past two years, I think, as a part of the, the men's national team is just seeing this from for what it is with a very clear vision and then addressing it by, you know, drawing these values to the surface and making them a part of how we filter our behavior. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the some of the big changes that we've had to go through is understand how those values are changing because because our environment's so much different. For sure. So I'm actually going to jump a question here because you, you mentioned something when you started naming clubs, when you name Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. But then now Chelsea, Juventus, like we've got more and more of these young guys that are coming right. through the national program yeah. that are playing yeah. overseas. So just from a logistical perspective, how do you go about keeping tabs on all these guys and making sure that you do have strong relationships with all these other clubs, because I would imagine like in your position, you're like this master connector and networker, right? You got to kind of interact with a lot of different people. So how do you go about doing that? It's taken time for us to get to the point where we are now. I think initially it's, you just have to be someone that they view as tangible. So I think it changes from club to club. I, I love picking up the phone and, and, or, or being on a call like this, and having it be very personal. That, yeah. But there's some individuals that it's like, listen, email me, email me, email me. But the contact is important. I don't, yeah. I don't judge either way. It's, yeah. you know, the, we have some really good relationships with different high performance departments and I've never had a call with them ever. Mm. And it's, and it's okay. It's, it's about the transparent sharing of information Yes, and it's about how clearly it's done. But we've, we've done a lot in this, in this COVID period to reevaluate that specific process that you're talking about, to be honest, you know, we've, I got to give Jordan Webb a lot of credit, including Darcy, just in, in the work that they've done to create new platforms that connect us to clubs in a very digital way, but it's just another arm. You know, if we were reaching out in the beginning with one arm and making a connection, cause it was the telephone or it was an email, you know, we just need to keep creating more arms. And now there's data arms and APIs and, different platforms that allow us to now share information a little bit more transparently. And Jordan's done a lot of work in this last period to create those platforms, some from scratch, some using platforms that were already in existence for us. And that, you know, that process is really, really important. The bare bones of it is, you know, you just create a very common sense approach to delineating the work. You know, I handle most of MLS and Obviously, I'll I'll keep tabs on England just because that makes sense based on on my past. Right. 
And Darcy keeps track of Germany. He keeps track of Italy just because of his past. Right. You know, we kind of divide up Scandinavia kind of depending <laughs> yeah. on <laughs> depending on the player. But we and then, you know, you know, and Ron Chenault, who's our head athletic trainer with, you know, Kentaro Ishii, Kenny Ishii, who, who is his assistant athletic trainer. They have a similar process in how they divide up our medical contacts. And what we've tried to do lately is. We've tried to make sure that it doesn't matter the call. We're all on the call. Mm, yeah. and, and that's been an important part of it. So if Ron makes a connection with a medical director at a club and they're going to have a call, it's most important that they schedule it in a way where Ron and that individual are available. But we're all copied in. And if we're available, we're all on the call. That's awesome. And then we've gone through this period that we've called our player first period or this player first program that we created where, you know, we're we're definitely making a conscious effort to be collaborative in the way we're reaching out to clubs so they can see us as a unified team of practitioners yes that are that are all con- that all are only concerned about one thing and that's the player that's yeah. it so that's been an interesting process over the past you know 7 8 months for sure is is kind of putting that into into play and we've developed systems to prioritize which clubs we feel like we need to pay more attention to based on a player's medical history or a player's availability history, that type of thing. And we've just tried to streamline what we do in a way where we're starting to see, you know, who needs us more, who needs us less, so on and so forth. And you have to prioritize those things to keep track of player pools that's that are growing. You know, we're I don't know if we're we've probably surpassed 60 players in our pool now at this point. If you're wow. dealing with dual nationals and you know individuals that are high potential players that are younger, you know, the pool yes. is growing and growing and growing. Yes. So it's it I think that's a big part of it is prioritize find ways of efficiently prioritizing your time, delineate the responsibilities, and then have a clear way to communicate what you learned to the rest of the group yes. if you had to do the call individually. And that's what we, we've got this way of logging our communications so that we can, at any time, we can see, ooh, a new, a new contact's been made and we can see a summary of, of, the, of what was covered and the information that was garnered from that phone call, things like that. So you, it's very systems-based in the national team, man. It's yes. very planning, 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 planning. I you have imagine. no excuse to not be prepared because yeah. all you have is time, right. you know, and, and that's, that, that's something that you have to take advantage of. Absolutely. So yeah. it's funny. I don't think I sent you these questions, but like, you're literally like going right into <laughs> the next thing. So these segues are awesome because nice. like one of the things that I'd imagine is like you said, you've got all this time, right? And then you build up and then you've got <clears> a camp, right? And a camp is yeah. like your guys' time to shine. You've got the athletes in house. But leading up to that, there's probably that element of, okay, we got to we gotta make sure everybody is ready and like kind of get tabs up to speed. Where is this athlete at? So prior to something like, say, a January camp or when you're going to get all these guys in, how do you go about determining player readiness and availability? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, Ron does a lot of work in the beginning because the first step is, are they medically cleared okay. to, to be in camp? You know, you, yep. you, you want to tick that box first. Yep. And in this period, you know, you're also talking about, We've had a few guys pop up COVID positive and, and, you know, we're dealing with that process of, of understanding how that influences not only who gets called in, but what we do in the first two or three days of camp and how we handle those things. And the first one would be medically cleared, you know, yep. and Ron does a great job of keeping track of the entire player pool when it comes to, you know, who's dealing with injuries and who isn't. And then the, the second step is, you know, we've, we, again, as a part of this process in the last six to eight months, we need to make it easier on clubs to share information. We've all been on their side before, Mm -hmm. right? When you're at a European club, all of your players are international players, which means when you start getting closer and closer to the window, every single one of those federations is asking you for information. And we think, what? it's not a big deal. It's one player, send me the information, but they've got 25 of those players, right? all of which their federations are asking for four weeks of data. And we need to make the process more streamlined so what we did is we created a portal for them. So we use Smartabase at the at the federation. So within Smartabase, we created a, a portal that's based on a username and password for the club. When they go into their portal, they've got tabs. And all at once, they can load all the GPS stuff. They can load any corrective exercises they want the player to continue to do while they're in camp with us. They can show us any maintenance work that's super important. They can show us their strength and conditioning programs, nutritional plans. It doesn't matter. Wow. They've got a, a portal where it's just like bop, bop, bop. And they're just pulling and uploading, 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 uploading. And they can just hit save. And then it's it all comes to us. Because once we get to the point where we're getting closer to camp, we want to know that chronic information. 
Yes. So that we can overlay that chronic information onto our camp projections and understand where there might be days where this individual player can come into conflict. Because it's two different worlds colliding, yes. Mike, is what's happening. You know, and, and when the two, if you've ever watched Braveheart, you can see both sides coming. And as they get closer to each other, they all disappear into each other. And it's swords and spears and, and shields <laughs> flying. And, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's really what's happening. <laughs> With, with when when they come into a national team environment. So what we want to know is when these two worlds collide and they start to merge, you know, what on what particular day for which particular player are we going to see, you know, a shield fly in the air or a helmet come flying <laughs> off? These are these are things we need to know. Right. So making it as easy as possible for the clubs to communicate with us is really, really important so that we can collect that information and we're doing all the heavy lifting. You know, all they need to do is keep a very small, tight, efficient amount of work for themselves, but we, we benefit greatly from it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So you've obviously been doing this for a little while now. You've had some success. So I'm really curious, what are some of the trends that you see in the soccer space that maybe haven't carried over to other sports yet? Because I feel like in a lot of ways, soccer's at the forefront. You know, like a lot of times people say, oh, well, soccer doesn't have like a, a strong strength training culture. But like the high performance model, like I feel like all these other sports are trying to get on board now. So what are some some trends that you maybe see in the soccer space that haven't carried over yet? Yeah, I can speak from my experience in the environments I've been in. Yep. And what I see is that it's become obvious that the 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 most the high performance departments that work at the highest velocity are the ones who are integrated, the ones that have moved away from a a segregated philosophy of medical is over here, sports science is over here, and really developed, you know, this one team approach, which as you described to me, I, I encompass in general as the high performance model. I think in other sports, you still see a bit more of the of the conflict and in some instances the just the hatred between medical side of the club and the sports science side of the club. I mean, it, it exists. We know it exists. In, right. And I don't mean to make it sound catastrophic in the way I'm describing it, but I, I've seen some environments where it's just neither side appreciates the other. Right. And it becomes very, very difficult for the player because now it's no longer player first anymore. You know, I, I've yes. seen some, I can tell you some disaster stories <laughs> of, of how, how that particular conflict turned into a competition that ended up hurting the player, right? Mm. And I do think that I've seen that in a bit more in soccer in that it's mo it's moving much more across the board to be a more collaborative type of high performance process. And I still see, you know, I've visited some college programs within different sports. I've had my share of experiences with friends and colleagues who work in the NFL or work in the NHL or, or Major League Baseball. And it, it just hasn't quite, found its way across the entire high performance landscape yet. But I think it's the one biggest block to higher performance is the ability to move past titles, you know, to, to instead focus just more on roles and responsibilities and to understand, you know, the true definition of what the high performance model is. You know, it, 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 is, it is designed to be an environment that brings together, you know, highly skilled practitioners all with very diverse but complementary skill sets. And they're brought into an environment where they're, they only care about one thing. And in most instances, it's the player, right? Yeah. But you can apply the high performance model to anything. You can put healthcare in the middle. You know, you can put sales in the middle. It doesn't matter what it is. When you're creating a high performance team, it has some very similar characteristics regardless of the environment. You know, if you're at Apple and you're creating a new iPhone, or if you're at you know, you're at Juventus and, and you're a high performance team that has to deal with the health and wellness of players. More often than not, you want the most skilled people you can possibly find. You want their skill sets to be diverse and complementary. And then you don't want any egos, right? At that point, you want everybody on board who's dying to achieve the one goal that you were brought together for. That's, that's the high performance model. And I think that in soccer is growing at a greater rate than it is in, in other sports. Yeah. And, and I even think in the United States, you know, in, in Europe, I think we're doing a better job moving that forward in the United States than in Europe. But that's that's my opinion. Yeah. I don't have f factual evidence of it, but that would be my general opinion. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. OK, yeah. last but not least, in our email exchange leading up to the show, you had mentioned mm -hmm. that there's potentially a lot of, quote, groupthink 
going on in the performance industry. And I wholeheartedly support this, but I would Mm -hmm. love for you to tell us first and foremost, what you mean by groupthink and how it's positively or (laughs) negatively impacting our field. Yeah, I mean, probably the quickest way to describe it, group think can be encompassed by the statement, we do it this way because we've always done it this way. Mm, Or we do it this way because everybody does it this way. Yes. You know, as soon as you stop thinking, everybody's in trouble, right? (laughs) Yes. And in general, you know, there are there are a lot of things we do in high performance that if you were to dig deep and figure out why we're doing it, there actually isn't a ton of research to support it. Yes. And a lot of times you've you realize that it was driven by the consumer market, not by the high performance market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's across the board, Mike, there's a lot, man. Not bad. You know, and, and more and more we can question what we do and why we do it and not be afraid to do that. And I think it's important in any environment, regardless of your role, you know, regardless of your high performance director or you're a entry level sports scientist, as an individual, you should be willing to accept the question, well, why? Why are we doing that? And you should be comfortable being questioned. Yes. And if you're not, then you got to ask yourself why you're not comfortable being questioned. More often than not, when a new idea meets resistance, somebody's threatened. And in general, I mean, you know, in the end, it's either consciously threatened or subconsciously threatened, but it's usually because something's been said and the you know, all of a sudden guards are going up and you meet this resistance out of fear rather than resistance, you know, out of, out of logical thought and, or maybe because experience can bring, can bring some sort of context to this new idea you have and you realize, okay, that's not going to work. Yes. For the most part, it's usually because somebody or something is threatened. And in general, that's the wrong reason to, to move away from new ideas and progressing as an industry. Uh, you know, uh, you've probably heard several podcasts that I've done and I've dive into this in the nutrition world a lot. You know, there are a lot of issues with what we're learning more and more about overall, what overall wellness really looks like, how to define it scientifically. And when we start to see what's really coming to the forefront, when we look at gut health and the gut biome, when we're looking at genetics and the understanding of lifespan, you know, just the the ideas behind, you know, genetic well-being and vitality genes, we are starting to clearly understand that certain ways that we train athletes, certain ways that we feed and fuel athletes is basically saying we have to choose between fuel and being sick. Yeah. And that and that doesn't make sense. There's there's no way you can tell me that in order to be an athlete and be fueled properly, you have to jeopardize your overall health and wellness. Those two don't make sense. Mark Bubbs does a great job in his book, Peak, talking about this, you know, about the, the idea of an elite athlete, first and foremost, has to be a healthy athlete. And the gut biome is, you know, heavily looked at in his book in a very, very cool way that needs to be addressed. And then just in terms of what we know now about, you know, lifespan and, and aging in and of itself, there's some very well-established research coming out of the genetic world that, you know, talks about how our diet and nutrition and how our sleep habits, how our general daily habits affect the aging as it, as just a general rule. You know, there's, you know, a theory by David Sinclair, if you've read his book, Lifespan, that aging is, is not just something that happens and it's outside of our power, that it might even be a disease. Mm. And when you look at it from his from his point of view, an individual who studied genetics as long as he has, it totally makes sense. You know, there's a few things on the horizon that if you throw it out there now, it's one side saying the world is flat, the other side saying the world is round. Right. You know, and you and that'll be the battle, right? Right. I've been toying with this for a while. I think every healthy athlete should be wearing a glucose monitor. You know, I think we should all be tracking our insulin, whether we're diabetic or not. And if it's even if it's for just a short period of time. And if I was to throw that out there now, I'm willing to bet there'd be people in multiple industries that would say I'm crazy. I, there's doctors that would say I was crazy. There's dietitians that would say I was crazy. There's sporting directors that would say I was crazy because they think it's too expensive. Right. <laughs> right. But in the end, it's clearly tied. You know, the, the way our body deals with insulin is clearly tied to overall wellness, health, and performance, 100%. 
And it's also really well known that every single one of us responds completely differently, like snowflakes to blood glucose rises and falling of insulin. That's clear. Well, why don't we get that as a part of their profile? Why would we not want to know that? No, they don't need to wear it every day for the rest of their life. But why would we not take a 30-day period and understand, you know, Jordan Morris does it every day. You can't tell me you can't play high-level soccer with a glucose monitor on. He's doing it at an unbelievable level. Yeah. Of course you can. You know, it's it, the the technology has gotten so good at this point. Everybody could wear it. You wouldn't even know you had it on. Darcy, Darcy just started wearing one for like 20 days. Really? Something like that. Yeah. We got to get, uh, we got to get some feedback on, yeah. on, on how he's doing, but it's, it, but it makes total sense. It makes complete sense. And group think would go, what are you talking about? What are you doing? Right. I've been told to stay in my lane, Mike, so many times that I've clearly understood that stay in your lane is code for I'm threatened. Right. I've learned it now, man. Yeah. And you can say what you want, but Einstein created the theory of relativity. He wasn't a physicist. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the Wright brothers weren't aeronautical engineers. So uh, stay in your lane is the worst thing you can say to anybody. And that's where I feel like this whole process is about fear. Stay in your lane because you're coming into my lane. Right. Well, who, who cares? That is not a high performance philosophy. It's not a thought process that exists in high performance. So that within the model, within the high performance model, it needs to be a term that never, ever is spoken. Yeah. You know, stay in your lane. And I think that's the, that's the process we're dealing with, man. It's not just diet and nutrition. I mean, even the way we train players, there's something that Darcy and Jordan are working on now about how we profile athleticism. And, uh, you know, there's some great stuff they're working on and I'll let them I'll, I'll let them divulge more. It's probably not my place to do it. But in the end, you know, what does it even, what does athleticism even mean? And the creating the context around it is really interesting. And we had a really cool conversation with Ola Eriks Root from 1080 Motion not too long ago. And uh, this, the stuff that, that, that's, that is being explored worldwide is really cool, man. And the bubble is about to burst in a lot of different areas, Mike. Yeah, And the, the ones who go, oh, you're crazy, are the ones that just don't want to change. And that's what I feel is a real issue within high performance is if we don't get away from this comfort level, this comfort level with where we're at and what we're doing, why change it? Everything's going so well type thing. We're going to struggle. Yeah. I, I remember watching, um, what's the, what's, what was the movie, Alex Hanel, The Rock Climber? Oh, um, I know what you're talking about, but I, I don't free know. Free solo. Name. Oh yeah. Free solo. There's a part in that movie when they're going through, you know, why are you even doing this type of conversation where he says nothing great ever came from comfy and cushy. Like that's, that's yeah. where we're at. Yeah. You know, there's a big part of high performance where we're just comfy and cushy, man. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you know, I've got my system in place. Let's just roll one day to the next. We're good. You know, and if you don't progress, eventually human potential just passes you by, man. You know, yeah. we've seen that there really isn't, we haven't found a limit to human potential yet. So we just need to keep progressing and questioning everything or else, you know, we're really not, we're going to get passed up as practitioners. You have to, you have to break that tendency to, to stay within that group thing. And that, that's, that's what I mean by it, man. I, I, I and that. I might be, I might be by myself in this opinion, but I think there's a lot of things we need to look at and do it totally differently because there's a good chance as we've learned in the past, a lot of stuff we're doing might be wrong. Yes. Right. It's worked for some people, but you know, maybe we've actually gotten away with it because we've gotten lucky, not because we were right. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I have yeah. that discussion all the time with athletes. They see so-and-so athlete doing something and I'm like, uh, maybe they're just doing well in spite of their training, not because yeah. of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, my yeah. guy, if you could alter the space time continuum, and give young <laughs> Steve Tashton one piece of advice about training in or life, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, for me personally, it would definitely be that the best leaders do more listening than talking. I, I talked too much when I was, I still talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was younger, I didn't, I listened, I listened to talk. I didn't listen to understand. Yes. So I think that's probably the biggest one. And that probably would have made me better in every area of my life. It would have made me a better son, brother, husband, dad, practitioner. You know, you're constantly evolving. You're never all, 
you'll never get there, right? right. You're, you're always chipping away. So I think that's the early, that would probably be the one, man, for me particularly, yeah. would be just listening to understand, not listening so you can decide what you're going to say next. Exactly. I think that's something most of us can take to heart. I know that's something <laughs> I've done myself as well. Okay. So I know we're kind of up against the clock here. You've got to get going here in a little bit, but I've got four lightning round questions, fairly okay. short. Your answer yeah. can be as long or short as you like. Okay. okay. Number right. one, do you have a career highlight so far as a coach? I guess my pause would mean no. Okay. And the only reason why I say that, man, is because what I've learned is that the journey is the good stuff. Yes. I remember after we won MLS Cup in 2008, I was shocked at how quickly it was all over. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, uh, Jim, who we talked about earlier, who was my mentor, was in the stadium. And I remember going and talking to him after it was finished. And he had won MLS Cup in 2002 with LA. And I said, I don't know if it's something that's wrong with me, but you know, the, the moment's gone, man. Like I'm not, there was no more elation. I wasn't like buzzing for four or five days. It wasn't like that, man. It was just amazing for that moment. And then what I realized is I don't remember how I got here. (laughs) And that was the biggest disappointment. So I think you could say, yeah, highlight was this this medal or was moving to this club or but but really in the end, because as you get older you have a greater context and you become more process driven, I think you realize that it's not really the there's not really the career highlights necessarily. It's just this appreciation of the journeys that you had to take to get to each one of those. Yeah, I like that a lot. The appreciation yeah. of the journey. That's right. That's good stuff. Okay. Number two. How much credit do you take for Danny O'Rourke's goal scoring prowess in the MLS? <laughs> Zero, because he didn't score any goals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, you get that. Like Chad Marshall would get that. But if you don't know Danny, Danny is our mutual friend. And Danny yeah. may be the most capped MLS player without a goal. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember at the tail end when he was in Portland. He, I'm pretty sure he had just a straight shot, him against the goalie, and just skied it into about mm. the 10th row. And I, I hit him with a message later, and he was just like, why would I? Nobody cares yeah. about the guy that just got one. Like, I'll just stay on yeah. zero, and everybody will stay remember on, me. Yeah. So. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's it's really, he's famous now because he didn't score. Yes. You, know, you score once, all of a sudden, he's ordinary. That's right. But I saw him hit the crossbar. Yeah. That's the closest I ever see him, saw him get. <laughs> what a, what a guy. I what a guy. It, man. That's our, our mutual good friend, Danny O'Rourke. Yeah. Number three, what's been the biggest struggle or hurdle for you so far in your new position? This is the first time I've been surrounded by this many unbelievable practitioners. Mm. Every single one of them could do my job. Yeah. So I think it's it's a challenge because there's times when I feel like they're so driven that I'm almost starting to lose touch with the progress they're making. Right. On all these different areas. And I'm learning I just need to be more connected to what to what they're doing and just sit back and watch them crush it. You know, yeah, uh, it, it's it's been interesting to think about, like, how do you in this environment? It's more about just giving people the freedom to be exceptional. Yeah. Because of the because of the individuals around us, you know, we're I think we're all in that position. That's that that's probably the biggest challenge. At some there's times when I feel like I hold on to certain things too tight, and or that I just didn't maybe I just didn't get out of the way soon enough, or right things along those lines. But I I think that'll continue to be the challenge for as long as I'm with the national team. Yeah, it, it is just this, you know, how do you how do you now work in an environment where the level of quality continues to rise. And now, you know, what does leadership look like in a situation where everybody's so exceptional? That that's that probably has been the biggest challenge. I can imagine. Okay. Yeah. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Steve Chazgen? Oh, that's a great one. <laughs> Honestly, man, like, I don't know if when you get older, you just, you just don't think as far into the future anymore. Right. I'm not sure if that, that might be my answer. I think I'm getting better and better at just thinking about the the next thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, right now it's November camp, the first camp that we've had since January. You know, right. I haven't I haven't blown a whistle in 10 months. Wow. So I think some of it is just what's next for me is November camp. But, you know, 
outside of that, I think, you know, not talking from a performance standpoint or not talking from a career standpoint, you know, it might just be continuing to get a little bit better at understanding how I can just be a better human, you know, in this environment with the things that we're dealing with in, in our individual cities, states, country, I think just understanding how I'm connected to the rest of the human race is, has been an interesting question that's crossed my mind for sure. Yes. In the wake of, you know, the things that have taken place over the last year, but I think that's a part of it. Professionally, I think it would be about, you know, just being that just more focused on the next day and, and having that process driven type of mindset. But for me, I just think it's what's next for me is November camp. I, we've yeah. got to get together. <laughs> yes. Professionally, I, I need to, I need to be a coach again. That's yeah. the start of it. I love it. And the last thing would be, you know, I think down the road would be, will I get the chance to play drums in front of 80,000 people in, in some huge gigantic stadium somewhere? That mm-hmm. would be cool. Yeah, I've been a musician my whole life, and oh. this period's given me a chance to. I set up a, my little recording studio in my oh, basement. Nice. I've had had some extra time, so that would be it. The next one would be one. You know, can I be a coach again? And yeah. two, you know, can I play at Wembley in England? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, that'll be our next show. We'll talk some nutrition. We'll talk about all the yep. sacred cows you want to burn there, and then we'll get like a like a little solo drum clip yeah. and work that in there and somehow. Exactly. I love Beautiful. it. Beautiful. I love it. Beautiful. Well, Steve, man, you've been so good to catch up with today. Where can my <laughs> listeners find out more about you and all the great work that you're doing? I'm not super busy on social media, but on Twitter at, at Steve Tashian. I'm on LinkedIn. They can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, that's pretty much it, man. I always try my best to reach back out to folks when they, when they try to get a hold of me and I find a it's it's really cool because you usually get somebody who will pop up and ask you a really cool question after they've listened to you on on a podcast and so I encourage it if you can find me and and we can connect I'm I'm always looking to have really good conversations. I love it. Well Steve, again man, thanks so much for coming on the show buddy. This was really great. Thank you man. Thank you. It's good it's great to see you again. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with Steve Tajan. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. Steve is just an awesome guy, man. I finally got to meet him live and in the flesh almost a year ago now, which is crazy to think about. Our mutual friend, Danny O'Rourke's wedding, and we just hit it off. I think we spent a good portion of the night hanging out, chatting, talking shop, and he's just a wealth of information, man. He's been in the game a really long time between his time with the Columbus crew, his time at Everton. I mean, the guy just has a lot to offer. And we even talk about nutrition, which I think is an area that he's very, very strong in as well. So we're going to have to do a part two. But if you enjoyed this show, if you enjoyed this episode, do me one of two favors. Number one, if you're not already subscribed to the show, please do that now. Plenty of ways to find it. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you go to consume podcasts, we are there. Click the subscribe button so you know each and every week when I drop a new episode. If you're already subscribed, thank you. Go one step further. Go onto iTunes. Give me a rating. Give me a review. Right now, I believe we are at 169 ratings as it stands right now. So we are getting really close. I'd love to get to 200, maybe even 250 uh, in the next couple months. So if you would do that for me, it's a great way to let new trainers, new coaches, new rehab professionals know about all the amazing people that we have coming on the Physical Prep Podcast each and every week. So my friend, that does it for me. As always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.